Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, I'm sure that you'll share my excitement in uh, welcoming the four composers that we have in front of us today. Um, beside me, we have John Adams, Zosia de Castri, Brian Current, and Daniel Bjarnason. And John Adams will be conducting uh, three pieces tonight, including a work of his, Slonimsky's Earbox, as well as a piece by Zosia uh, called Lineage, and a piece by Daniel called Bow to String. And on Friday, which is the final concert for this festival, uh, there'll be a work by Brian Current, which is actually a new commission by the TSO called The Three Pieces for Orchestra. So uh, we'll be very excited to see you there. Um, I think that composition is such a wonderful and mysterious process that I think we'll, we'll all be really thrilled to hear what your thoughts are about the process and uh, just about coming up with new ideas. And, and actually, um, I wanted to begin with, with Zosha and just talk a little bit about uh, the process of composing for orchestra, since this is a festival dedicated to the orchestra. Um, this piece, Lineage, uh, is your second work for orchestra, and it's been a dual commission by the San Francisco Symphony and the New World Symphony. Uh, how did that come about, and what was your, uh, what challenges did you face in, in writing for this commission? Should I, um, do I need to first? Oh, oh yes, of course. <laughs> 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 uh, so how it came about that this is the first time that this initiative, they've called the New Voices, was started. And they uh, worked with uh, New World, as uh, um, Kevin mentioned, and uh, San Francisco Symphony and the publishing company, Boozy and Hawks. And it was a chance to give young composers a chance to write for orchestra and also to write a chamber music piece and to learn a little bit more about the publishing world. Um, so it, it was really exciting that I was chosen to be the first composer for that. Um, and um, yeah, I, I guess that maybe one of the challenges in, in the program for me was writing two pieces in a very short amount of time. So mm -hmm. the decision process of when they decided this was going to go through and when the music had to be in was quite quick. Right. Um, but it was a really exciting opportunity and also unique in that uh, I would get to hear my piece play first by New World and then have half a year or so before the San Francisco performance. So that allowed me to make revisions, which is a, a really great thing to be able to you know hear and have time to change and then hear it again and see how those changes uh, came into play. Now was your, your first piece, uh, which was ALBA, um, mm -hmm. was that part of this, this commission as well? or? No, actually that was, that was my first or orchestra piece which John Adams helped commission, which was really exciting for me. That happened at the Cabrillo Festival in right. California. Um, so I had used that to, I had submitted that work uh, to show what I had done so far, but yeah. Right. Uh, can you maybe, um, and, and maybe John can speak about this as well, talk about how John Adams commissioned your, your first work and how that process sort of came about. And I just got a miraculous phone call <laughs> one day. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> no, but we, we, had, we had met first at the Banff Center. There was, um, I, I was doing a short-term summer residence, uh, and I had written a short chamber piece for that. And he was there. I forget which piece. You had shaker loops done, yeah. and I think it was uh, there to record uh, the string quartet. Yeah. yeah, right, the string quartet. <coughs> um, so that was the first time we met and worked a little bit together. Um, so yeah, it was very exciting. <laughs> great, great. Um, John, you have something in the magnitude of twenty-five works for orchestra. Um, I hadn't <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know you're just getting started, of course. So. <laughs> um, it, does it get easier the process of writing for orchestra? Uh, if if you just said does writing music get easier, the answer is no. Uh, um, obviously, you know, if you've written a lot for orchestra, you you know something that you didn't know when you started. Uh, that's a plus and a negative because, you know, the last thing in the world we want is for a composer to repeat himself or herself, uh, and there is too much of that. I mean, I, you know, I've conducted pieces by composers, and I've already been there in your piece before. But uh, so we always need to challenge ourselves with every new piece. Um, I don't know. I find I find starting a new piece is just always uh, unbelievably frustrating because I think I know what I'm 
want to do, like, you know, my next piece might be a string quartet or an opera or a piece for two pianos or something, and I had agreed to it a year earlier and thought I really had a great idea. And then when I, <clears throat> the day one comes, um, I, I have that horrible sinking feeling that uh, it's all over <laughs> and, and that everything from here on is just going to be crap. Um, um, and, and I think part of the reason it's so upsetting is, is that you want your next piece to be the best piece you've ever written. It's just absolutely a natural thing. If, I don't think if, if, if a composer doesn't feel that, I, I should Re rephrase that. I think if a composer doesn't feel that, then there's something wrong. I mean, we 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 want to think that every piece that we do is better than the previous one, and you know, the first hand scratches you put down are always clumsy. And 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 um, I try to console myself and think that uh, what I'm looking for is the the, the DNA. Um, you know, what is this piece about? What's its genetic? makeup and um, it's a, you know people go to they pay large amounts of money to psychiatrists and uh, spend half their life reading books on Zen Buddhism or or Wittgenstein or whenever to try to understand how their psyches work and we don't know and, and the, the creative process is uh, is so absolutely buried in obscurity um, because it has to do, it's in this amazing uh, complex that has to do with technical command and with uh, your personality, how you happen to be feeling that day or that year. Um, it has to do with, with your feelings about your place in history. I know you shouldn't think about those things, but you, you still do. Mm -hmm. uh, issues of style, um, you know, whether you slept well the night before. I mean, there are just so many factors that come in, um, and and they can either be like, you know, some bad chain reaction, uh, or they can they can coalesce and and produce something. And usually, it takes me months. Uh, before I have that first good day, uh, and and uh, you know, say, okay, this is this is bar one. It sucks, but I'm going to live with it anyway. <laughs> and 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 we go on. And then the other good thing is we can always go back and change bar one later on. I'm sure that a lot of composers here can really relate to that process, and I think that. With you voicing your feelings of frustration, actually, I have a little mic, so oh, I think I'm okay. Um, uh, it actually is sort of con consoling for uh, the younger generation, and um, I, I think, you know, to get back to the creative process, uh, with a piece like yours, Daniel, uh, you have such an imagination uh, when it comes to the actual narrative structure and, and what's being said behind the music, and I wonder if you can take us through how you approach this piece. Uh, maybe tell maybe tell the audience a little bit about this piece first and, and how it came to be uh, this orchestral version of Bow to String. Well, it's uh, it's hard to talk about just this version because uh, I think I just need to talk about the original idea for the piece. Mm -hmm. um, originally, Sayun, the cellist who's playing tonight, uh, asked me to write a solo piece for her, which I said I would do. <laughs> But then I, then I quickly realized that I didn't really have a solo cello piece, in, you know, that was ready, to, and I was scared to write a solo cello piece. So I just started adding much more voices, uh, and immediately at the same time, the idea to do this in the studio. We, I was working on an album, the album Processions, at the time. So, and this was something that I had been wanting to do for a while: is to take just one instrument and sort of treat it in that way to, to layer it heavily and uh, approach it a little bit more in the manner of sort of electronic music. Mm -hmm. so just layering it on top and programming it and, and uh, sequencing it and doing things like that. Um, so that's kind of how that piece came to be. And the creative process behind it is actually quite closely related to Sayin and, and her right. character and, 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 and sort of character pieces almost that suit her. Her, uh, 
her uh, sort of um, aura as a performer, mm -hmm. mostly, because she has a, a really strong energy as a performer, and she can be both very subtle and intense, but also quite big and, and ha have a, an aggressive right. sort of and And not character. to give things away too much, but uh, your piece is in three movements, and it has quite an unconventional structure, because you begin in this very ferocious uh, allegro, um, and then there's a slow movement, and then the last movement is a slower, a slower movement. And uh, I thought that was quite mm. brilliant. Can you talk a little bit about what took you there? Well, like so many things that I think end up working out well, it's like it, it, it has something to do with that they're not preconceived right, in right. that way. It, it sort of just happens. So it kind of happened naturally, just being this long, almost like a long diminuendo, mm -hmm. slowing down the piece as an arc through the through the whole thing. But that was not uh, not really something that I had set down before the piece started. It, it right. sort of came pretty organically out of the process. Great, um, Brian. What? How do you how do you fit into that in terms of your creative process? Because I know from looking at some of your work and actually from studying with you uh, many years ago that you have quite a strong preconception of what you're going to do. Do you? Intuit your way through the piece, or or uh, is do you pretty much stick to what you're what you're doing in the outset? Yeah, it's it's always in retrospect, isn't it, that you kind of look back and see, oh, how did this come about? You know, sometimes it's little impulses, you know, little drawings, little sentences, and then when they're impacted later on, then you find out, oh, that's what that meant, you know. And uh, f the best way I've heard it described, sort of the way all that all that music comes, like when any of us are trying to do this, the best way I've heard it is that is the airplane metaphor where you're up 40,000 feet and you're looking out the window. And at first you start to, you see, you know, mountains and fields, you know, s the squares of the farms and things like that. And that's just the first impression. And then, then as you keep on going, uh, the plane gets lower and lower and you start to make out, oh, there's roads there. Oh, there's, you know, maybe trees in the distance. Oh, that's that kind of farm. Then you get lower and lower as time goes by. And you start to make out, oh, there's there's trucks and there's cars, and you get more and more detail, and you get closer and closer, and there's you know people in the cars, and there's grass and leaves, and and finally you you're the plane lands, we hope, and <laughs> and then you, every detail is in its place, and you actually can't um, you know imagine an, another time that those details weren't there, and so I think it's our job as composers to get that plane down right. on the ground, um, you know by the time uh, by the time the deadline. Right. So we all know how it <laughs> inspiring a deadline can be. Um, so, so one of those first little impulses for this piece is uh, one little drawing was there was a serene line, and then this kind of entangled texture above it, and and this has worked its way into a, a, f a number of pieces and culminates here in this in the first work um, that they'll be playing on Friday, and more and more. Uh, you know, as I progress with this kind of texture, a serene texture and a much more rich texture, uh, they have become inseparable, and the upper one has been a, um, a, a place, a musical place that is infinitely bright, infinitely dense, and infinitely calm. And more and more, I'm not really a religious guy, but this has become more and more a metaphor for, me for heaven and earth. Right, and so that's so. The title of the first work is called "Earth So Much Like Heaven, Heaven So Much Like Earth" because it, it speaks of those those two layers. So there's a string that are playing that serene line, and then there's this complex texture above. There's really sort of bright sounding instruments like the glock and and vibraphone and and flutes and things like this, and that they're trying to be very active and very calm at the same time, like like water or like sunlight. So that's right. that's really the f the f um, the first piece of the the set of three. Um, and the, the whole thing called Three Pieces of Orchestra is, is, is kind of a boring title, but the, the, I'm more invested in the, the sort of the, the inner movements and they're pieces that can stand on their own. So, um, so the, the middle ones, or the middle one is called uh, Without Grace, the Universe is Just an Explosion. And this was from a text by Christian Bach. It's actually a tweet. He just tweeted that out one day. <laughs> he goes, without grace, the universe is just an explosion. I was like, wow, that's wonderful. It's a great title for an orchestra piece. Um, and it speaks to why we, we need music in symphony orchestras in the first place. And so, um, uh, and that, one, that one's really about sort of the, just the kind of beauty and, and the violence of, of creation, I hope. Um, 
And then the final one is called Motion is the Default State. And that was just another little sentence that I'd written right at the beginning that I tried to describe the music. And later that turned out to describe very well like the whole piece and it became a, a much a bigger title. And there I'm, I'm trying for the first time, I think, um, this as, as I advance into middle age, <laughs> is to is try sort of spectral things where where harmony and color are the same thing. And so I'm trying to make these these big pulsating blocks of, of color. I should mention that the title of this talk today is actually the title of that movement, Motion is the Default mm -hmm. State, because I think the metaphor for that is quite interesting, and mm -hmm. you speak wonderfully about that. Um, this might seem like a hackneyed transition, but is there a bit of John Adams in that movement? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. I think that, uh, you know, I've, I've definitely always admired John's music, and uh, so uh, trying to work with color in these ways has always been very inspiring. The, uh, the very end is I'm trying to do these, these pinwheeling arcs of color that overlap with one another. And if you've seen a pin, pinwheel out on the, um, you know, when they're doing these, these, these marches out on a parade march, and, and the, so the, the guy on the outside, the, the pinwheel has to walk faster than the person towards the middle. So the, the instrument on the outside has to travel and play a lot more notes than that. So, um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, so it, there's definitely, um, uh, there's definitely a lot of sort of, I've always admired like sort of the use of color and gesture in John's music, and, and I'm sure it's worked in many ways. There's, there's um, a couple interesting moments in your piece, I felt, where you have these patterns of repetition that sort of grow and grow and grow and then climax in, into something that's quite different. And I thought that was quite, quite spectacular. Um, it leads me to, to ask John, actually, about um, minimalism a little bit and what you consider your relationship to minimalism to be at, at this stage and how did that sort of evolved over time. Yeah. Well, I think uh, we can now talk about it from the vantage point of being fairly well into the 21st century, but I, I think minimalism was one of the most important uh, revolutionary moments in 20th century music. Uh, it certainly was highly debated when it first arrived and ridiculed. and. Um, Um, I, I left college or university in 1971, and uh, uh, the, the prevailing models for composers then were um, sort of post-war European avant-garde composers like Berio and Ligeti and, and Boulez. Um, and the way of being radical was to embrace John Cage. So uh, I, I wrote a lot about this in my book, Hallelujah Junction, uh, because I, I, I just couldn't identify with the, uh, the European style. I mean, it, it, it just, first of all, I, I really needed tonality. Um, and because I had a background you know, with, with jazz and, and rock. I wasn't a performer, but I listened to a great deal of it. <coughs> I also needed a beat, and it was <laughs> just an awful time because, uh, you know, your professors aren't the ones that freak you out. It's your, it's your colleagues that are the ones who really just grind you down. And, um, you know, all my, all my graduate student friends, and so we'd get together and, you know, have these old sessions and, and um, it was so depressing because you know somebody would walk in with a score of Gruppen or Marteau Saint Maitre <laughs> under their arms and and, uh, and you felt horribly intimidated if you you know didn't know the tone row or um, you know whatever all these details so um, I discovered John Cage and John Cage was at first, he seemed like this ter tremendously liberating force because you know he didn't uh, subscribe to that. Although eventually, I found out that John Cage was every bit as as didactic and fussy and and procedure oriented as as Boulez or or Babbitt. Um, it's just 
he didn't care what the results were. Uh, uh, well, that's not fair to say he cared extremely, you know, that they were produced according, according to the chance procedures, but there was this sort of whatever eventuality, which to me was really absolutely ran against what I believe to be uh, how culture operates. I think culture operates by what we receive from the past and how we, we absorb it and, and then add to it. And, you know, there was a movement in the, in the 60s which was, you know, it was a very revolutionary movement, both, both with the Europeans and even more so with Cage, about turning your back on the past. Or if you had anything to do with the past, you had to go way back to Josquin or, uh, you know, Heinrich Isak or, or whatever. And so when minimalism came along, it was, it was this amazing, uh, provocative, uh, moment because uh, the music was tonal, and as I as I once said about Steve Reich's music, he he reintroduced the pleasure principle into into music, and uh, you know, and then I w went to a concert at Philip Glass, and my God, the place was full. Instead of twenty people in the audience, you know, there were a thousand or so, all of which was deeply provocative and upsetting. Uh, to you know, the university composers and even to music critics who'd finally arrived at embracing Eliot Carter, uh, only to be bothered by this new thing called minimalism. So uh, I, I, you know, I moved from writing these kind of uh, Cajun-inspired process pieces to, uh, you know, to taking minimalist ideas, and and my first couple of really mature pieces showed. Uh, definite traces of minimalism, uh, pieces like Fridging Gates and Shaker Loops and, and Harmonium, uh, and even parts of Nixon in China, which was written somewhat later. Um, the problem I had with minimalism was that I found it uh, really an extension of modernism in a certain way, in the sense that it was very kind of rigorous and, and pure. I mean, the sounds were luscious and gorgeous, and you had Steve Reich's beautiful you know, pieces like Music for 18, which are just, you know, no one ever get tired of how beautiful that caressed the ear. But there was a certain kind of rigor that didn't fit me as a person because I, you know, I'm a much more dramatic, dramatically impelled composer. My mother was an actress and, and uh, you know, I was drawn to uh, a kind of musical expression that was more unpredictable and more explosive. I wanted to be able to go from a low energy state to a sudden high energy state, all of which were a absolutely against the minimalist canon where everything had to be, you know, just step by step by step. So, uh, you know, that was really how I, I started evolving my language. What, what I think was controversial was that I, I really did use the pass a lot more than you know, my colleagues, you know, I, I had grown up listening and loving the European canon and I played it. I played clarinet, you know, in symphony orchestras and I conducted and, and so I had a much more intimate relationship with composers like Beethoven and Mahler and Stravinsky. Um, and uh, so I, I, de I developed a, a, a musical language that, um, you know, at first they called it minimalism, and then somebody tagged it and called it postmodern, and 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 they finally just stopped calling it whatever. Um, but I think it's interesting because I, you know, in the in the young composers' music that I often conduct or you know am involved with, um, I think what I was doing in this in the seventies and eighties is is now become very common. Um, I was thinking of Daniel's piece today, which, uh, uh, you know, it has this uh, kind of grinding, uh, heavy industrial strength first movement, and then the second movement alludes to, um, you know, sort of maybe tango, uh, um, and the third movement is this just amazingly still sublime moment that, that really reaches back to some of those great Mahler adagios. And, um, 
you know, I see it in, in a lot of the younger composers now that we seem to be in a period that's not as, as horribly orthodox and, and punishingly exclusive as, uh, as the bad old days when I was uh, a student. Yeah, it's true that um, the 20th century in particular seemed to have a lot of isms that yeah. uh, evolved, particularly in the latter half, I think. And, Minimalism, um, communism. Right, <laughs> yep. Uh, and I, I wonder now if, if the pendulum has swung back to uh, a period of there's a lot of permissible things that we can do. Everybody is a sort of an individual. I, I, I think so. And I don't know if that heralds uh, you know, a decline. It could. Um, I'm always aware that certain art forms really can go into decline. Um, I, I'm not saying music, but it's possible that the kind of music that we make, um, you know, peaked at, at, at some point. Uh, you know, it may have peaked with Stravinsky. Uh, um, I'm not saying this for sure, but on a bad day, uh, I, I wonder, because, you know, the musical language, um, it's not infinite. And gestures and tropes, um, you know, at the time of Beethoven, it was like discovering the new world. You know, there was all this natural resources, and no one had been there. Um, and now, uh, you know, I feel sometimes like I'm panning for gold, and this, you know, maybe a nugget now and then. Uh, but it could be that we're in a very loose period. The, the, the problem, of course, is, and we all know this, when there are no rules and there are no templates, every time you you sit down to compose, you have this. Uh, horrible burden of having to create your own template. And I think sometimes how lucky Mozart was that, you know, he didn't sweat those things. You know, oh, I'm going to write a rondo. I'm going to write an adagio, ABA. I'm going to write a minuet and trio. So his originality came in the way that he invested those very commonplace templates with, with, with his genius. And God, I'd love it if I could do that, if somebody could hand me a template and I could just do my thing. But nowadays, we all have to invent our pieces from scratch. I'm, I'm curious, actually, of whether the other composers uh, feel the weight of that lineage. I mean, you have a piece called Lineage, and it explores the point of origin of things. And it seems to acknowledge the fact that we all come from s some body of influences. Th is that a burden for you when it comes to creating new material? Um, I guess in some ways that part of why I wanted to write that piece is to acknowledge that there are those links to the past because it's true that even though people are maybe more open um, now than they have been in the past, there is still this idea of you always have to be original. You have to do something that, that's new or find some new sound or find you, your own unique voice, um, which I think is you know a valid pursuit, but I think that it's, uh, we don't exist in a bubble either, and we have listened to music throughout our lives and studied with teachers, and so to pretend that that's not going to influence your writing, I think, is not fair. So in some ways, this piece is looking at that, but also sort of um, how this piece uh, fits in relation to other pieces I've written, how it fits in relation to pieces in history. There's a few sort of winks into different directions towards composers that I admire. Um, but yeah, wh what John was saying is a very good question about, you know, where things are headed and whether we can really be doing new things. It's, it's a scary thing to think about, <laughs> but I think it's an important question, too. What do you think, Ray? Uh, <coughs> for the brief period I was teaching, I kept telling my students that, you know, there's no way we're ever going to run out of melodies. <laughs> because it's just on the on the the piano alone, it's um, you know it's 88 factorial. Just you know just the the amount of combinations, and that's just on one instrument. And, um, and so there's th I still think that there's there's all kinds of possibilities out there yet to be explored. I remain hopeful, and I also remain hopeful that um, that you know it's a wonderful time to be looking forward as a composer, and that you know it's just um, with. Just the, the the ensembles are getting better and better and better, and we see even student ensembles getting better and better and better. And the technology is letting us do all these amazing things that we've never thought of before. And so I just I'm, I just feel fortunate to be w composing in this time. I mean, we don't even have to 
you know, wait for CBC to come pick up our concert anymore. We can broadcast it around the world on our phone. You know, it's, you know, all these concert halls are forming in China. And so I'm just, I'm really, um, I'm, I'm just really excited about uh, where music is going to go. I, I can't imagine it right now, but <laughs> <laughs> in the future, I'm just, I'm just really kind of psyched about what the next young composer is going to come up with. Wonderful. Any thoughts on this, Daniel? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a huge question, obviously. I mean, um, I sometimes think about, I don't remember if it was Robert Anton Wilson or Buckminster Fuller who was talking about the law of doubling, information doubling. So uh, the exponentiality of, of knowledge in the world, so that the last time th that any mathematician could all actually know all the math there was in the world was like 1890 or something, and then it sort of doubles. And now we're at a point where the streams are so extremely many that specialization is so extreme, nobody can see the big picture anymore in any field, almost. Um, and it's the same in art, in a way. You know, we keep producing more and more art. There's a longer and longer history, and I sometimes think about symphony orchestras. Um, it's not possible that they can keep I think uh, doing like the whole canon of Western music, and it's happening already. You know, there won't be in 50 years or 100 years an orchestra that can uh, credibly, in one season, do everything from Bach to whatever is the most current music of that day, like in 2150 or whatever. If there will still be orchestras, and these are all you know questions that are nothing about this is safe, right. and also it shouldn't be. But as a as a as an artist and as a somebody who's living and making something, it's it's really hard to think your way into a solution for this. I mean, the, you you actually you have to just keep doing what you're doing and try to intuit what is what is happening in our times. It's you know you're like a barometer in a way mm -hmm. for what what is going on in society and in art around you. And then you try to distill something from that that you think has makes sense and has uh, something, some purpose. But that's something that I think about, and that's it's one of the reasons I didn't want to uh, uh, go into like when I finished my bachelor's in composition, I didn't want to study more composition. I went into studying conducting, uh, and through that, I came out with the knowledge that the world doesn't really need more music. It just needs more good music, you know. There's, but that's that's a kind of a catch-22 because you can't just choose one. <laughs> it's a pyramid, you know. But it's uh, it's something that you know you think about. You know, why why am I actually writing this music? Is it does it is it needed? Is it necessary? But at the same time, that's kind of a counter. Uh, that's not a very productive thought. I should mention that you hail from Iceland, and you have actually conducted. And that explains the, everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, um, and well, you've actually conducted the Iceland Symphony and the uh, Icelandic Opera Company. And um, how does that experience of going into conducting and performing uh, does that affect your composition, or, or maybe vice versa? Sure. Yeah. yeah. It it does, and I'm sure John will tell you the same. It's uh, mm -hmm. It's a relationship that, that definitely touches with, you know, has a lot of touching points. Um, first of all, it makes you quite, it makes you kind of uh, pragmatic a little bit, in hopefully in a good way. Um, but it also just gives you, yeah, it gives you a good insight into the mechanisms of, of an orchestra. And it also just helps with, uh, I think every composer should try to, to to do it as much as he can. If mm -hmm. not conduct, then at least be in very close contact with musicians because it's just that sort of hands-on report and, and the report with musicians that is very helpful. John, one of the things I admire so much about what you're doing is that you're, you've conducted all these works of your own but also of uh, younger composition students. And Can you speak about that a little bit? And well, I I, th uh, I was really lucky 
that I was able to conduct uh, because when I started out as a composer, I could I could conduct my colleagues' music, um, and it helped to build a uh, a community. Um, I I actually started conducting when I was in high school and. Uh, the university where I went had an orchestra, uh, had two orchestras. It had an orchestra that was conducted by one of the faculty members, and then it had a second orchestra about a, you know, a classical size orchestra, which traditionally was conducted by an undergraduate. And so I got a real hands-on experience there, you know, having to get on the phone and find a second bassoon player when somebody decided they weren't going to show up at the concert. <laughs> um, all of which is really important. It's really important, hands-on, as you say, practical reality. Um, and yeah, I, yes, I could conduct my own pieces, but I also could could sponsor other composers and, and do their music. Um, and I continue to do that. Uh, last year, I. I <laughs> I did the Elliott Carter Variations with one orchestra and the Philip Glass Ninth Symphony with another one. Uh, that was an experience. Um, All in one concert? No, not in one concert. <laughs> uh, but, um, and I also, you know, love to do the classical canon, everything from Beethoven to uh, Stravinsky and, and um, um, a lot of American music as well. Um, I think that for me, uh, the, the performing half of me fills the circle, completes the circle. You know, it's like yin and yang, um, that the creative act is so kind of, uh, I feel sometimes like the Unabomber, you know, the guy out in the <laughs> shack somewhere in the woods, you know, not talking to anybody and being kind of antisocial. I even have a shack in the woods <laughs> where I work. <laughs> um, and uh, my neighbors know not to bother me. Uh, but, you know, you can do that, but you have to come out of that. And, and you know, it, Mahler is such a great example. Of course, he was completely not the kind of person you'd want to have to live with, uh, because he was very tyrannical to his family, and it's a, just a different era, you know, where you had, you know, a nurse maid for the baby and five servants, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. That nowadays we're not like that, but uh, um, I I move from that quiet, introverted kind of life to to being plunged into the kind of week I'm having this week, you know, where I have to get up and go face an orchestra that I don't entirely know, under circumstances that I don't know, and so I have to become a public person and speak and be nice and you know, <laughs> do all the things that we composers generally don't do. Uh, you know, make sure that our socks match and... and uh, it's a good thing. I think it's a psychically healthy thing um, for my music as well as, you know, for my own personality. And I enjoy it. I mean, it's really fun to be able to bring pieces to life. Um, you know, in the last two, three days, you know, I, I've, I've introduced Socia's piece to the orchestra. And the first time through, you know, you have to think what an orchestra player they, they get this thing with notes and a lot of rests in it, and they have no idea where they fit in. And the conductor gives a downbeat, and, and uh, you know, you get this kind of shapeless thing that, you know, it just vaguely resembles what it ought to be. And uh, it's really a voyage of discovery. And what's amazing <coughs> in a case like a wonderful orchestra like the Toronto Symphony is how how intuitive the the learning curve is. You know that the first time through it's kind of not a very pleasant experience, and people don't look like they're having a good time, and you might get a couple of cranky comments. And um, uh, the second time through, you know, this is this amazing things start to congeal, and. Um, 
you know, by the day of the performance, um, these magical things happen, and that's part of the thrill of being a performer. I think we could uh, keep chatting for, for hours. Uh, uh, actually, I want to have a brief pause and see if we can take any questions from the audience. Uh, we have a brief period for that. So are there any questions that I can take <coughs> directed to anyone? If not, I'll keep asking. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, oh, okay. Great. Uh, thank you. I'll try and keep this brief. Uh, I just wanted to go back to the idea about this motion moving forward and the progression of art. Where is art going? Question. And at least from my perspective, where I see it right now, is there's a bit of a, a, a conflict going on with an establishment of the, say, the classical music industry and with creativity and technology on, on another side. For instance, in the orchestra, let's say you wanted to have a particular uh, sound on, a, on an instrument that's very quiet, but you wanted it to be prominent in the sound. If we had a microphone in there, you could bring that out. I mean, this kind of creativity comes from where there's boundless amounts of creativity going on in the mixing in the studio. So I'm just curious if any of you, like, and this is just, I'm just opening up the can of worms here because I think it's a huge topic. Uh, one, one more comment on this, actually. Andrew Stewart, a uh, composer friend of mine, made this uh, comment where you have these violin students at his universities at that are 22 years old. Okay, they've been practicing for hours, can play all these concertos, but they don't actually know how to place a microphone near their instrument, or they have never, you know, gone through the process of recording. So uh, I feel that there's sort of a conflict going on here as to where the next art is going to go, and I believe it's going to have to start embracing these things. But if any of you have anything to say about that, it'd be so. Great. So just uh, to clarify, it's the conflict at, between the sort of acoustic classical <laughs> of of orchestras, but uh, but the technolog technological just, uh, all production. The, all the, all the, like the orchestra itself that we're using right now is designed in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And like, for instance, you'll, you'll, you'll go to an orchestra, uh, we've worked with orchestras, and you'll go to a meeting where they'll be t discussing, are we going to get a seventh second violinist or not? Can we afford it? Whereas they don't have a composer, they don't have a sound engineer, they don't have any of these disciplines within their orchestra, but they're still trying to make sure that it satisfies the nature of a Brahms second symphony or something like that. So that's my general question. It's a huge topic, but. Brian? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've noticed, I think the, um, the uh, where we feel this the most, I think, is in opera, in the opera, in opera house. I, and um, because this, I think where the public feels, the, uh, the public is so with amplified voices. And opera is so in non-amplified voices, and that's the there's a huge disconnect with the the public. And there's some young American composers like David T. Little are starting to do these things that are all amplified, uh, and he's amplifying all the instruments, and it's got this kind of rock feel to it. But the music's still really detailed, it's hugely detailed, really well worked <laughs> out. But there's also some uh, the sound is not coming from Stradivarius; it's coming from Samsung, right? It's it's coming from somewhere over there. But uh, there's this huge energy and excitement around this piece and around some of the other work that's being done by these composers. And it's because it doesn't make, them <coughs> make it sound like a museum. It doesn't make it seem like a fragile thing um, on, on, you know, that's on this distant stage. And I, seeing that, I got really excited. And, but I'm, uh, for my own part, I, I'm not, I think that the, the challenge will be to marry the amount of detail that we're used to getting with writing for symphony orchestras with this this new sort of technology, if that I, I don't know if that's an answer, but yeah. I I don't know if I, that I have the same experience as you regarding music students or even people working professionally that they don't know much about technology. Because I feel especially the younger generation of performers coming up, a lot of people do a lot of things. Where they're doing they might have an orchestra job, but they also mm -hmm. play an ensemble and. The, uses electronics or maybe they compose themselves mm. and uh, or play with loop pedals so I feel like that's we're going to continue to see more of that um, and I, I think it's definitely something I'm, I'm interested in but I've worked on that more through my chamber music working right. with electronics or with sort of more theatrical or, or visual things that would sort of transform uh, and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully take it to a new level but I think it's difficult with orchestras just given how little time there is. I mean, this as an example, I came in yesterday and heard the piece once today and 
gave a few comments, and that that's pretty much it. So the idea of experimenting with microphones and amplification, or adding that uh, element, it would just really someone would really need to rethink the model of how they're going to financially make that workable, and also make sure that everybody's on board. But I think that on, on a smaller ensemble level, we are starting to see, um, like I, I know some of the ensembles in New York actually have sound guys that come to every one of their events, and that that's their job. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're like a performer. Yeah, Kronos ensemble, or something so. like that. Kronos Quartet, they have a whole, yeah, they exactly. have a whole audio engineering team that moves around. Yeah, them. so I think that that's, that, that'll be interesting to see <coughs> where that evolves to. I don't know how it'll fit into sort of larger scale things like orchestra or opera, as you're mentioning. But even, I, I think there's some vocal groups that are also interested in, in working with amplification, mm -hmm. and they know how to adjust or change their sound uh, depending on the circumstances. You're not going to sing with the same sort of mm -hmm. operatic projection that, uh, that you would if you were not amplified. Um, right. Uh, can I just say one thing on behalf of, in defense of the seventh violinist? <laughs> I, I'm not against it. I, I think Brown's score no, should be realized well. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not against the it. The thing is that um, if we're talking about orchestra music, um, it, it is it is fundamentally what you're talking about is an economic issue. I don't think it's an aesthetic issue. I think that most performers who are 40 and younger are totally comfortable with with microphones and they probably worked in a studio and maybe have even you know experimented with their computers and you know and, and uh, I haven't found anybody who has been uncomfortable with, with technology in fact most people really dig it um, but the thing with the orchestras is that Beethoven pays the bill um, and uh, we need financial support to keep an orchestra up and running. And, um, you know, I, I just came from a concert in, in Spain where the, the, the hall had 2,000 seats in, and because it was an all new music concert, there were only about 400 people there. It was very depressing to walk out, you know, and you've been working all week and saw this tiny crowd. Um, <coughs> so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really, difficult balancing thing between being <coughs> innovative and trying new things, which of course Wagner did, um, with all those new instruments he wrote for and with the whole concept of, you know, the Bayreuth pit and things you know, like that. It must have been very expensive but, at the time. But, um, <laughs> you know, unfortunately the priorities are first to get, you know, the Beethoven symphony up and running and, and you know, get people into the hall, um, so it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really a difficult thing. You know, I have, I've been involved with some orchestras that just have this fantastic audience and they have phenomenal community support in terms of people writing checks like the Los Angeles Philharmonic and they, they do Brahms and Mahler and, you know, Carmen of Arana and Rite of Spring and all that stuff that people love to hear. But they also do a, a contemporary piece on every program. But there are other orchestras, um, you know, that are suffering constant stress from, you know, they're on the brink of annihilation. And to come to them and say, well, why aren't you doing more pieces, you know, with technology and microphones and da 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 da, da and they look at you and think, you know, my God, we're, we're just worry if we're going to be able to pay our players next year. So it's a tricky thing. Are there any other questions that we can elucidate? Just a bunch of introverts. <laughs> 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 I don't know how to ask the question, but you just brought it up. The, the issue of audience and what you said earlier about the breaking down of the influence of orthodoxy, ortho orthodoxies. Um, you know, I think a lot of damage was probably done in that period when there was a certain approach to music that alienated the, the Beethoven lover, but maybe that person was open to hearing some new stuff, but it was so extremely not what they were used to that it ended up becoming something they just didn't want to be a part of. Um, is there a way, is there, you're a way back, of course, but is, is there, do you see in your profession now things that composers are thinking about 
that are maybe more audience, I mean, it's not the way to put it exactly, but audience friendly. Um, you know, I, go ahead. Well, I, I, you know, when I was 21, as I said, you know, the models were Stockhausen and Boulez and Milton Babbitt and, you know, now 21 year olds, 21 year olds, their models come from indie rock and you know they they I don't think most of them want to write for 10 other composers in their audience I think they want to have large audiences I mean they spend infinite amounts of time on the internet you know promoting themselves and tweeting about their upcoming events and things and I think that's healthy I really do because I think what we lost during that period you know the period of atonal, whatever you want to call it, you know, the sort of su su severe avant-garde. What we lost is, is we lost touch with the fact that music is really the art of feeling. And we are communicating feeling to, to one another when we, when we compose a piece and when we perform a piece. Uh, obviously, in intellection and, and, you know, all kinds of other things come into play. But feeling is the number one thing. And, and, you know, this was the great cognitive dissonance for me when I was a student because, you know, our having to parse 12-tone rows and the Webern cantata or something, and then, you know, and then I'd go back to my dorm and everybody's listening to Jimi Hendrix and, <laughs> and you know, I kept saying, something wrong with this picture here. Uh, so I, I think, as you say, the answer to your question is right here. Uh, and make sure you come to the concert. <laughs> <laughs> We have about five minutes. There should be. There's. I have to have a comment. Yes, go ahead. One is during that period of time. I mean, that it's it's been quite a long time since that. Now, I mean, we've gone further. People here, these composers, are you're all writing in, in a different kind of language. So, what has been so slow in the uptake of the audience to come and be curious about what? you know, the contemporaries are saying in the, in the art. Because the, certainly that music is not programmed all that often anymore. So it's, it's a time gone by. And yet we still haven't captured the imagination of a large group of people to want to hear this. That's I, one thing. I, I'll, I'll let these younger composers and two, weigh in on The that. other thing is yeah. at, uh, there is a, a question of gate, the gatekeeper. That is, who is is programming the music that we hear publicly, and how do you, how do you disseminate that? The other thing, Brian, you said, you know, people are recording with their telephones, and well, there's there's a whole issue of unions and what have you. The Toronto right. Symphony certainly can't do that that easily. Right. So, there, so there there are you know still some things that we have to deal with. But those are a few comments that maybe somebody would want to. John, do you want to take a stab and then pass it uh, off to? What was the first question? It was, <laughs> <laughs> I was the about. question was about the amount of time that has gone oh, yeah, by yeah, since yeah. the intellectual yeah. music has okay. been. Okay, I I do think that e even though we don't write, uh, you know, really extremely thorny stuff like, you know, Zanakis uh, or uh, Ferniho, uh, uh, the four of us. I still think what we do is, is challenging to the average listener. I know what I do is, and I'm thought of as a softy compared to <laughs> a lot of them. So, uh, you know, even to go to a concert and listen to a Mahler symphony for a lot of people is a daunting experience, and they end up not doing it. They think, oh, I'm getting $50 for that. I could be watching Homeland. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and there is an enormous amount of, of competition, you know, distraction from, from everything from the internet to movies to, to, you know, very good indie rock music. And so there's just an enormous amount of, of, uh, of competition. Um, and classical music is not front and center on the radar the way it was even 
70 years ago. You know, when Stravinsky was alive, I'd just been reading this monster biography of Stravinsky by uh, Stephen Walsh. And when he was alive, he was as famous as Einstein. Everybody knew Stravinsky's name. They may not have known Agon or Catacom Sacrum, or if they did, they hated it, but they, you know, he was a, he was a big star. And nowadays, your big stars are, you know, Bruce Springsteen and, and, and Bob Dylan. It's a different sort of thing. So I think we, we have to probably be content with a smaller audience, but that doesn't mean that what we do isn't important. This may be one of you want to have the last word. I think this is the last. Uh, <laughs> Daniel. Uh, I agree with uh, what John is saying. I think. I think it's. It's. You can't exact. You can't exactly place the question to why. Um, contemporary classical music hasn't caught on in the same way that maybe Mahler symphonies did 60 years ago or something. It's, uh, I think we just live in such a completely different world now where there's so much distraction, there's so much to choose from, there's so much, uh, there's HBO, you know, and there's, there's, there's all those things. So uh, that's like one, one thing of it, one part of it, I think. Um, there are different, lots of different strands to this question, I think. Um, one part of it also is that I think uh, composers maybe um, have gone into the model of the dead composer too much, being that they, they, they sort of uh, are happy to be programmed by orchestras or recorded by ensembles on orchestras uh, and not sort of being front front men or making their own albums and releasing them in their own names and having it as their their thing but they're sort of they're in this close relationship to organizations the whole time and which is normal and healthy and ensembles but uh um it's it's maybe more difficult to identify the composer today than uh in in for say a sample rock music or where the where you have the front man you have the people sort of making the music who are fronting it, whereas, whereas in classical music you'll have maybe St. Paul Chamber Orchestra plays works by three composers on one album, and it's a little bit more blurry, you know? It doesn't have that focus. Um, so I'm all for, for example, uh, composers also just making their own CDs um, in their own name, you know? And, and really controlling the whole, the whole package of that. And you design your own. Well, I record my own and, and release them in my own name, at least. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you do the artwork as well? Or you choose it? No, I choose it. Yeah, yeah I choose it. Um, um, yeah, just to come back to the technology thing a little bit, I think that is also just something that will, is happening and will happen. Um, and Organizations, I think, one thing doesn't exclude the other, obviously. You can still have technology in symphony orchestra concerts and not. You, the, the acoustic music doesn't need to stop existing even though things become more technical. Uh, but I think organizations need to be open to it because otherwise we'll end up excluding a lot of composers that would be interested in writing for this medium but come to a closed door when things get technical. And that shouldn't happen, I think. That would be a shame. I think we're out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you so much for participating in this panel. It's been such a great discussion. And thank you all for coming.